All righty. So the first one is from Mark. And his question is, the scene with Jacob in Genesis 32, 22 through 32, was one of those that stood out to me as odd when I first read it. Now he wants to know, and he's got about five questions here, so I'm just going to kind of read them all and then let you attack them. Mm -hmm. He wants to know, in this situation of Jacob wrestling with God, a unique biblical story, or is it based on something else for the sake of theological messaging? If it is unique, do you believe it happened? As in, did God take human form and allow Jacob to physically wrestle? So if it is based on some other story or event, what is the writer taking from and what is the message? What is the significance of the anatomical location of injury to the hip? Is the story event a kind of telling of man's free will in that God allowed man to wrestle with him or a foreshadowing of what is to come in Israel's future in the Bible? Okay, yeah, Genesis 32, again, is this uh, incident where Jacob wrestles with, you know, the the man who, when we go over to Hosea 12, we find out, and, and even in the Genesis 32 passage, we find out this just wasn't an ordinary man. Uh, Hosea, of course, uses the term Elohim there. And, you know, when the, the name of the place, you know, happens in the Genesis 32 passage, when it's named Penny L, you know, I've seen God face to face, then, you know, we get an indication this isn't just a normal guy. So, again, with, with, with that as a backdrop, I'm not really sure what the questioner means by, is the story based on something else? Does I don't know if that means another text, some external text from some other civilization. So I'm, I'm not really sure there. Despite that uncertainty, I would say I don't think that this, this story itself is based on anything. I, I, I don't know of any evidence that would suggest it's taken out of, you know, some other literary text or it's borrowed, you know, in, in some sense, you know, for a polemic purpose, you know, like, like you see in other places. So I don't think it's based on anything. I think it's just part of a series of theophanies and angelic appearances as men uh, in the book of Genesis. So Again, in in that sense, it's normative. Uh, for those who've read Unseen Realm, would know that yeah, I you know I I accept what the biblical text says in these instances that God not only can but did appear in human form. Uh, an appearance of God in in human form uh, isn't unique. It, it actually happens in a number of places. Again, for those who have not read the Unseen Realm, you'll get a bunch of those. Appearance of the angel of the Lord or just other angels in human form. Again, nothing unique. There are plenty of examples. Now, what's unique here, uh, one aspect of it is is the wrestling, okay, is the is the struggle. Granted, Genesis 19, you have angels physically handle Lot. Of course, Genesis 18, they have a meal. So they do physical things, uh, but, you know, we don't have any sort of fight or struggle uh, in another episode. So that part of it makes it unique and again that that's that's part of the uh part of the story is that you know you you have this this episode that is a a way to illustrate or or maybe cast in a different light because Jacob's name is going to be changed to Israel but sort of the things that you know he's encountered uh, you know, in life, the difficulties, you know, abstractly that he's encountered in life, his struggles, so to speak. And so, you know, and it really his his strivings with God, because, you know, the whole episode of stealing the birthright and, you know, some of the other stuff he's done, this sort of gives visual or in, in this case, corporeal form, I mean, for the sake of Jacob, a, a, a sort of visceral time and place reminder of really what he's been doing spiritually, you know, struggling with God and against God. And so it becomes kind of a, a living object lesson for him. And, you know, we, we can pick up on that because we can go back and, and read the account. Now, what about the, uh, yeah, the injury to the hip? And the, the hip is specifically mentioned in verse 32, and that's important. Now, let, me, let me just read it. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Now, the reason I, I say that's important, it will become evident in a, in a moment here, but just generally, what we have here is is this is a, a comment by the writer to sort of cast an explanation for why later Israelites, the, the phrase unto this day, therefore to this day, the people of Israel don't eat this or that. So later Israelites, again, had this, had a custom of not eating, again, the, this part of of the thigh that is on the hip socket. That that doesn't come from Leviticus. Okay, that's again it was something customary. And so the writer living post Jacob is explaining this custom in light of this event. So it, it provides an explanation for for the custom. That's an editorial note added to the Torah 
you know, either by when it was this portion was originally composed or something later, but it gives a justification or an explanation for the custom. Now, I want to read uh, just a statement here from one commentator. Uh, you know, a lot of the explanations get kind of long and windy, but this one brings up something that I think is worth uh, addressing in light of some of the stuff we've talked about in Leviticus. Uh, Westermann says, the reason given for the prohibition, which does not occur elsewhere in the Old Testament, is difficult. The prohibition is concerned with a part of an animal's body, whereas the event that gave rise to it was concerned with a person. Jacob. The most likely explanation, according to, to Westermann, is that this part of the body was subject to taboo because it was regarded as belonging to the reproductive area, the, the loins, okay, because it, it, it's the thigh that joins the hip. I don't really buy that. Uh, and, and I mention it because other listeners might come across that. And we've had sort of these abstract laws and rules and customs in Leviticus that, you know, as we're, we're still going through the book uh, of Leviticus, but we, we've run into these things before. And again, they, they've made sense in their own context, but, you know, there, there are some problems here. On the one hand, it's true that various references in the Old Testament to the quote thigh in English translations are actually euphemisms for the genitals. Okay, that that is true. Uh, for instance, let me just give you an example. You know, we the Eliezer, the servant. You know, with Abraham, the, the, this whole thing about you know, put your hand under my thigh and vow to me that you're going to find a wife for my son, so that my lineage can live on and I can produce an heir and all this you know kind of stuff. Again, without getting into the details, this was a familiar expression because. There's nothing sexual going on between Eliezer and Abraham, but the idea of of putting the hand under the thigh, really putting it under the, the genital area, specifically, this vow was taken to ensure the survival of the lineage. Okay, Abraham was looking for a blood, you know, or you know, to continue the bloodline, you know, through Isaac. Isaac needed a wife. So there are certain contexts, and again, this is a, a an ancient Near Eastern, if you want to call it Middle Eastern custom of antiquity as to how you would take a vow, because it, it sort of linked your success in the vow, not only in this context with someone else's line, but again abstractly, you were binding yourself to an agreement and the and and the the well being of your own family either in terms of retaliation or in terms of success or failure, you know, depends on on your ability to carry this sort of thing out. So that, that does happen. It's true. But I don't really think that this kind of works in the Jacob passage. It seems better to say that the struggle left Jacob uh, with a permanent injury to perpetually remind him of the event. And and the event is, the focus of the event is his name change. So again, he has this, this physical infirmity now. And every time his attention is drawn to that, well, his intention will be drawn to this struggle and the fact that you're no longer Jacob, you're Israel. You know, again, just the whole episode and, and what, what happened to him physically and spiritually through, the, through that. And then later generations, by adopting this custom, would also be reminded of the event. So, so the, the, the food taboo here sort of commemorates the event as well. As far as foretelling, you know, something about man's free will or what's going to happen to Israel in the future, I, I, again, I'm not sure which future we're talking about. Is this the bonding, bondage in Egypt? I would say no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Blessing, uh, maybe, but again, I, I'm dubious of that. Exile, again, I, I don't really see this foreshadowing specific uh, future events, you know, and I, I realize why the question is being asked. You could say, well, this conceivably conveys the idea that as Yahweh's people, Israel, persecution is going to come, you know, physical harm is going to come. But I would say that's kind of a bit odd because this was an angel, and I would argue likely the angel of, of Yahweh, who inflicted this. And it wasn't a punishment. Again, it it was part of it was leaving him with a physical reminder. And, and you know, of, of all the biblical figures that might need reminding, of a, of a relationship they have with with God and and their responsibilities, it might be this guy Jacob because he's continually just flip flopping all over the place, you know, with his loyalties, his own his own ethics, that kind of thing. So I think it just makes be better sense to go with with something like that rather than try to abstract it too far out. 